Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Um, we are, man, we're knocking on the door of June. And you know what that means. It means means my kids are very excited. Um, it means it's June. And June is, uh, it's, it's really the craziest month of the NBA year. Because it's when pretty much any rumor that can be printed. Not that's fit to print. Not that's fit to print. Any new, any rumor that can you can type with the words on a page, uh, it will make its way out into the NBA stratosphere, and um, we will be obligated to talk about it. So it's going to be a busy month ahead. We're not quite there yet, um, but we got things started off last week with Cap or No Cap, and so now that he's now that he has given us the opening, man, it shows how little I know about music. The opening part. Yeah, let's go with part. The opening part of his opus for the year of our Lord 2023. We will now get into some of the the big bangers, as it were. Ladies and gentlemen, the master of the salary cap, Jeremy Cohen. Hello, sir. Hey, John. Yeah, this will this will be an interesting one. For context, for those of you following along, John has no idea what we're going to talk about today. So None. this should be exciting. First, though, I do want to extend a heartfelt apology, uh, or actually not an apology. It's really more my condolences to you, John. Hey. As we're recording this Monday, May 29th, a little after 5 p.m., and yes. about 25 minutes ago, Nick Nurse was named head coach of the Philadelphia 76ers. I would imagine that Nick Nurse doesn't go to the Sixers if he doesn't think Joel Embiid will be there at least through next season. So that probably puts cold water on your Joel Embiid uh, wet dreams, so to speak. So I, you know, uh, it'll, a dream deferred to another year, perhaps. But well, two it will things. not likely be this year. Two things. One, I don't know that we get in the age of in this age of star movement and NBA volatility. I don't know that we could ever say anything beyond one season. I think I, I completely agree with you. The fact that Nick Nurse signed on, I think he must feel pretty good about the fact that whether James Harden is leaving or James Harden is staying, Joel Embiid is not going anywhere for at least the next, let's call it the next season, like the next year. Um, I would completely agree with that. Number one. Number two, the nice thing about Joel Embiid, and I, I think this is actually a larger point that is kind of going to be my, my overall theme for this offseason is that I don't have my hopes set or my sights set, my hopes up, whatever. The, I'm mixing my metaphors here um, for any one thing. Um, if Joel Embiid, if, if everything we just said is nonsense and Joel Embiid ends up getting traded to the next grade, I love Joel Embiid. I think he's a great player. I think he's going to win a championship someday. Um, if he doesn't, I'm fine with that too. Um, if the Knicks do nothing, which neither of us believe that there's any chance of happening, that's fine. And if they go out there and they make all sorts of trades, for the most part, I'll be excited and I'll be looking forward to it and I'll be in on them because I believe in this front office. And I believe this front office through three seasons has shown us a level of responsibility. Um, my, my daughter still has her qualms about Scott Perry. Scott Perry, you know, he's a holdover. So, uh, He's, he's, no, I'm kidding. Scott Perry's done a great job. The, the whole front office has done a great job, and they've really given us very little reason. I won't say no reason. Very little reason to doubt them. Um, so I, I'm excited to hear what you're going to talk about today. I think I have an idea of what today is going to be about, um, which is a topic that is, of course, near and dear to my heart. Um, you but I'm not going to say anything else. So, yeah. What? You might be surprised. You might. You okay. Know. But before we start, because I literally cannot help myself... Uh, since we're talking about the Sixers, we won't have another opportunity probably to do it if we're no. laying the Joel Embiid thing to rest. I know that there's the idea of James Harden likely out the door and the Sixers have, you know, what are they going to do? What I think that's going to happen if James Harden does indeed go to the Rockets, which I would imagine is the case, the Sixers and the Rockets find a way to do a sign and trade. I would agree. And it gets James Harden to Houston for, you know, the max, four year max. But what it also does is it gives the Sixers like a $47 million traded player exception. And then, you know, are Fred Van Vliet and Nick Nurse on good terms? Does Fred Van Vliet get traded into the, you know, sign traded into the, the TPE that the Sixers created from moving James Harden? Do they go after Chris Middleton? Like, there are all these different types of 
names who could be on the market who you could get creative with that. And that's what Daryl Morey meant when he said, we have to be creative. I haven't seen it floating around that that's how they would be creative. But if I were in their shoes, I'd do everything I could to create that TPE, move forward and build around Joel Embiid while I have the reigning MVP still in his prime. But that's just me. Yeah. And um, Philly isn't as... They're not as landlocked as as some may think. I believe... I think they could trade their 2030 pick after this draft. I might be mistaken about that. Um, But they do have their pick in this draft also. So they do have a first that they... Obviously, they They can't trade it before draft night. They don't have their pick. I thought they had their pick. Utah owns their pick, 28th overall. You then they ha- maybe it's I think there is a there's at least one first round pick that they could trade. Maybe oh you well, know what it is? I might have been thinking t- uh, towards my my Embiid column that I wrote a couple weeks ago where after next year's draft they could trade that first round pick and then maybe they could trade something a first that's distant. So you're right. You know what? They can't yeah. trade. So that would be that would be a nifty bit of maneuvering for for Daryl Morey if he could um get someone into that traded player exception with with no first to trade but Listen, I'm not going to yeah. doubt him. We'll see. So, well, without further ado, I'm going to present what we are doing today because uh, I'm really excited about it and it should be slightly different, but equally as I fun. can hear it in your voice when, when we, we talked this week. You, you are excited about this one. Very much so. This was a labor yeah. of love. I have been working on this for two months. Two <laughs> months. And it has grown into something that I think is a lot of fun, but it's comprehensive. So... Given that uh, I don't want to be here till nightfall, and I'd like to see the Celtics Heat game, which will be hilarious regardless of how it ends for me. I can't. Uh, wait. I'm kind of in heaven. Uh, I want to talk about the theme of today, and we're going to be talking about Knicks archetypes, specifically figuring out what the Knicks like and what they don't like. So here's the bottom line: I see all these different players, rumors, everything that kind of goes around. And oftentimes, there's certainly thought that's put into it, but it doesn't necessarily line up with what the Knicks like, who they are, what they try to do. And I'm my goal here is let's try to figure out everything that has happened, or at least touch on what has happened, and see if we can use that as a model moving forward. So here's the thing, though. I view this kind of like a, a consulting type situation. So for context, in my day-to-day job, when I'm not building these cap or no caps or uh, appearing on pods, I work in what is considered an executive recruiting consulting firm. What does that mean? So basically, when companies need to fill senior positions, you know, it could be CEO, CFO, CHR, whatever it is, the, the, okay. the people make way more money than I do. My, th- these companies hire my firm and say, we need you to fill the roles because we are having trouble doing that. So we do all the dirty work in terms of trying to get all these candidates and bring them to the table. When we are hired, we have kickoff calls with the client. Client tells us everything they need to know. So for example, let's say one of the searches I'm working on is uh, I I work in the financial officers practice. So that's chief financial officers, chief accounting officers, um, finance type things. So Let's say one of them is a Fortune 500 company and they're in the consumer industry. And they say, we really want a sitting CFO, but also it could be a former CFO. It could be a a current chief accounting officer. It could be a senior vice president of finance. But we want them to come from a Fortune 500 company. And they need to be in this, 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 and they can't be this. We say, okay, cool. And then I go to another search. It's a small private equity backed company. They're looking for a CFO. Uh, they're in the biotech space and the CFO, they need to be in a similar position in the biotech space as well. Why am I bringing this up? Because I can't go to the Fortune 500 client with the private equity candidates and I can't do the, I can't have the Fortune 500 candidates to the private equity company. They're completely different searches. Can't cross and for the me. Right. Exactly. You can't double dip from that pool. There's no overlap. And NBA teams are often like that, where teams just build themselves differently. So kind of what you're trying to build may not mesh with exactly what you're doing. So I'm looking here as the Knicks, as our client. The difference here is we don't have the access to call up Leon Rose and say, hey, Leon, what are you looking for? So the research now falls on me. 
and falls on others to kind of put the pieces together. And I know that there's frustration from some about the Knicks aren't speaking. It's frustrating that we can't get any quotes, whatever it is. Respect that opinion. It You don't need any of that in order to think about what the Knicks like and where they can move forward. So all of that being said, John, uh, I'm going to start, but I want to turn it over to you right before I do that to get your thoughts. I mean, I, I've put in many calls to Leon Rose. Uh, he, he he calls me back sometimes, but I always happen to be busy, so that's on me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know time. it's just, and my voicemail box is always full too, so it's mm. I, I don't make life easy for him. Uh, no, I think I think you nailed it. I I think um, you know, I I I wonder how different team how how much flexibility different organizations build into their team building philosophies. Like are some organizations more stringent than others? And I'm sure if we looked organization by organization, um, we could probably get a a pretty clear picture of that. Also, obviously people who have executive executives that are in, in place for longer periods of time, you know, maybe have a little bit more in by way of trends. Um, but for purposes of our conversation, I think it's pretty evident that the Knicks have a type. And I just want, and I guess the question for this summer is, is there a player or players that can hit the market um, such that they would reconsider um, how they go about things? But, you know, we could be here all night talking about those possibilities. But for, for right now, yeah, completely. They, I think they have a type. Agreed. And yes, we'll talk a little bit more on what you just uh, touched upon, but let's go over the agenda for today. So what we're going to do is we're going to establish the Knicks archetypes. We're going to identify team comparisons. We're going to look at past Knicks acquisitions and targets, try to find a pattern, evaluate the key Knicks players, and then assess talent. And we might even look at alternatives if we have the time. And spoiler, we probably do have the time. (laughs) So let's start with the point guard. Specifically, I I like this. you You could look at the guards, but There are a lot of important factors that go into all of these types of players. And a lot of this also ignores so much of the intangibles we don't have access to, right? It's the mental capacity. Like we can't necessarily judge how players are in the clubhouse or their leadership skills. We can do an okay job, but we don't know the players. It's hard to gauge that. So if you're watching, what you basically see is a three circle Venn diagram. And in one circle, it's pull up drives, it's pull ups, like pull up shooting. The other, is ability to drive. And then the third is efficient. So, you know, how efficient are you? And the goal is to be one of these three if you are a Nick guard. And the sweet spot is obviously in the middle where you can pull up at an elite level, you can drive at an elite level, and you're incredibly efficient. And as you will see, that is Jalen Brunson to a T. He's perfect here. Obviously, pick and roll is very important to these players and, and the archetype, but you that's really what the Knicks have been trying to get. And there have been players in the past where they might check off one or two of these boxes, but then they're not great with another one of them. So it's so nice that the Knicks finally have someone who can do all three of these things at a high level and also is turning 27 years old this summer. So that's really refreshing. Now, I want to take a look at some of these uh, and, you know, there are going to be some stats here that have been really helpful. The first one is B-Ball Index. They're incredible in terms of a lot of the information they collect and they do a great job of plotting everything out. If you're not watching this, that's cool. There's still going to be the presentation attached to the YouTube video as usual. Um, but if you are watching, I've got on the X axis drives per 75 and the percentiles that they're in, right? So then you've got on the Y axis pull up shooting talent percentile. Now, the pull-up shooting talent percentile is basically described as not just creating pull-ups, but also making them too. And I've highlighted a box where you really want to be in. It's the 75th percentile higher in drives, 75th percentile or higher in pull-up shooting. And if you look at it, I've got the Knicks over the last three years. They're point guards, uh, at least 200 minutes played. And you've got a lot of the Knicks in that box. You've got Jalen Brunson this past season. You've got... Uh, He's at the tippy really- top. To, to the right. He's, he's, yes. he is the basically, it looks like the hundredth percentile for both. He's really good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you got Derek Rose in there, even though third year, you know, this past season, Derek Rose was not effective. The ability to drive based on the percentile and his pulling up ability certainly is there. 
You got all three years of Emmanuel quickly. You have a little bit of uh, Dennis Smith Jr. in there. Kemba Walker actually made the cut. And just missing the cut, you won't believe this, is actually Alfred Payton uh, because he drove so much and he didn't hit pull-up shots, but he created them in such a way that it kind of impacts the talent. But we'll we'll pick apart, you know, why, how, and everything. Uh, you don't want to be outside of this box, really. The, the two players outside of this, Frank Nielakina, who is no longer on the team, and Deuce McBride, both of whose seasons are, you know, very far away from that. The point being, though, obviously, Deuce was a good pull-up shooter in college, and the Knicks are banking on his defense yeah. to take the next steps. So you live with it. And now just the one more thing before I go to the next slide. Uh, there are going to be some fluctuating uh, minutes per or uh, minutes played uh, on a season. It's I tried to keep it as uh, stable and dependent as possible, but there's certain times where I had to skew it just to capture other players. So it was a little bit more broad. This is an example. If we then look and, at the point guards, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, just real quick with the, with the, you know, for, it seems like a million years ago now, but with the Frank thing, you know, Frank was here for what, a year under this regime? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a little bit more if you include when Leon Rose was actually hired. And like a lot of fans at the time were like, why isn't he getting a real chance? It, I, I think it, you know, and we kind of spoke about it at the time, but I think it does speak to your theory about Nick archetypes that like, you know, the the apex version of Frank Nilakin, I don't know that we've ever seen that in the NBA, but like was not even that best version was not really what they were looking for. And it's what basically from the day that Phil Jackson was hi- fired or, you know, relieved of his duties, whatever you want to say, X number of days after drafting Frank, it's why I was doomed to begin with because they never wanted what, what he brought. And, and sure enough, it, it makes sense that he was um, ushered out in short order after Leon Rose uh, took on the job. Agreed. So if we look at uh, now, let's shift gears a little bit. True shooting percentage that can better capture the efficiency and drives per 75. Uh, the best players, Jalen Brunson, far and away. You got basically th- all three years of Emmanuel quickly. You've Derek Rose, the first year he was acquired, the we here year. Um, you have him sort of last year. He just falls a little short, I believe. And then also falling a little short, Kemble Walker. So this kind of matches up with the fact of the players the Knicks typically like Jalen Brunson, Emmanuel quickly, and to an extent as well, Derek Rose, it's you're efficient, but also you can drive. And then if we look up the pull-up versus true shooting percentage, I actually decided to include guards and wings. So we've put to, we figured out the point guard part, right? It's pulling up, it's efficiency, it's uh, pick and roll, uh, and it's driving. It's really those four things. If we shift gears and go to all guards and all wings that the Knicks have, we're going to look at true shooting to measure efficiency here. And we're also going to look at how they pull up. And now I've got, again, I've increased the box just, just to get a better understanding of where they're at. And these are, again, over the three years the Knicks have been here. So this is, this so, is now yes. you got to be at least in the 50 percentile, 50th or higher in both true shooting percentage and pull up shooting. And, and it's, it looks like it's about 10 guys or eight guys. Yeah, so it's Jalen Brunson, Emmanuel Quickly, uh, it's Evan Fournier previous year, it's Cam Reddish this year, which he kind of snuck in there. I, um, yeah. I'll explain why I don't think that. Well, I mean, actually, from a pull up shooting, it's a little different, but uh, true shooting percentage, you know, different story. Um, but yeah, it's it's Alec Burks who obviously was not efficient, but is at least generally wasn't. Uh, then came to the Knicks, saw more efficiency here, pulled up really nicely. That was great. But you really want to be inside of this box if you're a guard or a wing. But you don't have to be. That's the key thing here. You don't have to be. And if you look all the way over at the players who are not pulling up, who have really high true shooting percentages, you will see Josh Hart, Quentin Grimes, and Reggie Bullock. Right? So these are the more wings. I mean, you know, it's kind of interchangeable at a a certain point. But these are three players where... Their archetype is they're not pulling up, uh, but they are very good in terms of their true shooting percentage. And if you go to the next slide, you then see, okay, there are also those three players really good defensively. And in this slide, you've got efficiency on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you have something that B-Ball Index created. It's called D LeBron. It's essentially their way of capturing and measuring a defensive impact. And so 
Well, it, you know, also in this box, I mean, again, it's, it's Hart, it's Grimes for two seasons, it's Bullock the season he was in New York, it's IQ uh, this past season, it's Alec Burks in 2022, and uh, funnily enough, it's Derek Rose in 2021. He had a really good defensive season yep. that yep. year. Um, excellent job. And this is Nick's guards and wings of at least 400 minutes played. So we're starting to get a clearer picture. Okay, we got the point guard part down. Now let's think about the guards and the wings. Essentially... If you're not a creator, if you're not going to pull up like crazy on offense, that's totally fine. But do it efficiently. And also, you got to be really good on the defensive end. And it matches up exactly. Josh Hart, really efficient, very good defender. Grades out really well on, on defensive EPM as well. Uh, Quentin Grimes, same thing. Really great defender. Efficient. Doesn't need to be a pull-up guy. Reggie Bullock, the reason that they also wanted to shift gears away from him was... Yes, he didn't pull up, but also they didn't necessarily need him to be that person. They essentially needed him to be more of a of a wing who just kind of does what he did, but it wasn't good enough, and he regressed a bit when he went to Dallas. So the bottom line here is, again, you don't have to do everything, but you have to fit into the role. And these three players, I mean, again, Hart, Grimes, Bullock, fit into that role. And conveniently enough, that is also the mold, at least theoretically, that the Knicks foresaw Cam Reddish to have. Cam Reddish, you don't have to be a pull-up shooter. That's fine. But there was some promise there defensively. We'll go into that a little bit later. That's fine. You also just have to be the efficient part, which last season he wasn't terrible at. It was the other stuff that kind of rolled into play that just didn't help him. Um, yeah. Partially him, partially on the organization as well. So we're getting a clear picture here. Um and now I want to shift to force right now. I'm going to be honest. The power forward position is actually what we know the least about of really all five. And the reason is there's been stability really since the moment the draft started in 2021 um, or 2020, I guess I should say it's the 2020 draft. OB draft. Uh, yes, the OB draft. So here we're using on the Y axis. This is O LeBron, which is again, the ball index is. D defensive version, but just with offense, uh, capturing kind of overall impact. And then I wanted to look at usage rate because I'm fascinated by how the Knicks utilize their force. They often decide we want them to be higher usage players. Now, so these are not all, all yeah. Knicks on this chart. Correct. Now we have shifted because there have only been two forwards, effectively, two power forwards on the Knicks that have really gotten playing time. I wanted to capture the entire NBA. So here you're looking at in the year 2021, this is basically just plotting all three years that the Knicks have had Julius Randle and Obi Toppin. So in the first year, Obi's rookie year, 2021, that was Julius's all NBA, his first all NBA season. You've got Julius with a very high usage rate up there with the likes of Giannis and Zion and AD and Pascal Siakam. DeMar DeRozan's there. And then you have Obi, who's much further back in terms of usage. And his offense is not as good, but Julius's offense was great. Um, but it just wasn't obviously sustainable based on how Julius was operating. He needed a point guard. Didn't get that the next season. And if we go to the next season, we will see Julius Randle. High usage rate. Mm. Did not do well offensively. As we know, 2021-22 season was not a good year for him. Obi actually had a very good season, especially for a backup. I'm not saying that as a, you know, as a parameter, just he had a really good season. He happened to be backing him up. Um, he was used more. As you could see, he shifted into what I want to say, like the 65th or so percentile for usage rate. So the Knicks were trusting a little more and you might see a third player that's highlighted behind Scotty Barnes. Tough to see. I, uh, his face is hidden. Who's that? That's actually Isaiah Roby. And the reason I added him was because I was curious where he would fall because again, any more data points that we can add to this power forward discussion is I think relevant. So I thought, Hey, you know, what's the deal with him? And Roby's best season was 2021, 22. So he actually had a decently high usage rate. He was above the 50th percentile. Wasn't the best offensive player, but the gamble here is okay. We could do worse with a third string four. That's where they see it. And then last year, or I guess this past season, year 2023, Julius back up best season by far off of, of O LeBron. Man. Fantastic. Right. I mean, we can talk That's about all the other things that, that don't go, that didn't go well. And we will address those, but yeah. from a usage rate and an O LeBron, he was fantastic. And you got Obi 
who even with his efficiency kind of in the toilet compared to the year before, his O-LeBron was like the 73rd percentile. And he was a higher usage rate player. And that box where you see no one, uh, that would be where Roby would be. If you see ghost boxes, it's because that's a player who didn't qualify, but I wanted to make note of where they are. Gotcha. So it's really just, again, the Knicks seem to like their fours as hubs on offense who can be higher usage. But there's also the difference in that, and we'll talk about this more too, Julius gets so much of his offense through pull-up shooting. That does not happen with Obi Toppin. That does not happen with Isaiah Roby, which always will make me wonder, do the Knicks care about pull-up shooting at the four? Or do they just have someone who does so much pull-up shooting there and not enough maybe elsewhere on the, in the roster that they prioritize that position because they don't have someone who can pick up the pull-up off the dribble creation shots? Uh, yes. I, 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 it's, a, it's a great question. And again, it's like, well, let's just go off of what we know. What we know is um, when Tibbs took over, it was made very clear to Julius Randle immediately, you got to work on your shot, which he did, and it showed in his first year. And then after his shot went in the toilet in 2021-22, I guess it was Johnny Bryant who uh, conveyed the message this past summer and was like, we got to get you back to where you are not only shooting it efficiently, but you you are just pulling up constantly, um, which is why Julius shot so much that they put him in the damn three point contest this year. And I, I think I think the answer to your question, which is a great question as far as why he pulls up so much, I, I wonder if it's like a little bit of they they have this thing in Julius Randle who they have built their offense at least partially around. Obviously, this season changed over to some of some of Jalen Brunson as well. And I think they knew that the only way that that offense would have a prayer, a snowball's chance in hell of working, is if Julius just anytime he was open, he just fired away. Um, so I don't know what I don't know. Maybe that might be answer choice C, but I feel like the answer lies somewhere in the vicinity of like. Yes, they have an archetype. They they know what they like. They know what they want. But in order to get the most out of that, this past season at least, they needed to adjust it somewhat, or 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 you know ha- have it do a certain thing. Hundred percent. No, I agree. And it'll be fascinating to see if Julius is here to do that. If another player is here to do that, we'll find out. But in the meantime, let's talk about the centers. The centers, I think, are actually kind of the easiest, easiest to, to figure out. Um, yeah. What we've got here is true shooting percentage on the Y-axis. and On the X-axis, it's uh, the D LeBron percentile. This was in 2022. And there are three boxes here that I've got. They're all in the top right corner. It's Mitchell Robinson. It's Isaiah Hardenstein. And it's where Jericho Sims would be if B-Ball Index didn't consider him a power forward for, um, mm-hmm. for that season. But it goes to show that they have a type. Um, very good defensive centers who are efficient. And then when you look at this past year, uh, the issue here is Hartenstein just did not have an efficient year. The year prior with the Clippers, and again, you saw it. He was really impressive and, on the efficient end. Yes. And, and he's in the 60, roughly 65th percentile for true shooting. I would, uh, I, I bet you a couple of bucks that if it was from the middle of January until the end of the season, which is when he started getting healthy, he would be right up there, not too far from Mitch and, and Jericho in terms of efficiency. Yes. And I'm, I'm curious because you've looked into this too. Would you say, John, that the floaters that he's attempted, do you think that impacted his efficiency compared to the year prior? Compared to when he was with the Clippers? Yeah. Because I, I, again, this is, I'm now talking more off the top of the dome, but it feels as though he's done more in terms of stretching out the floor, uh, but I need to go back and check it. I just wanted to see if you. Might I mean, have had a look there. I think his, I think his shooting across the board just got so. I mean, there was a stretch for two months in the. I want to say it was from around mid-November to around mid-January, where he was hitting like I, I haven't looked at in a while. It was either just above forty percent from the field or like just below forty percent from the field. I, I mean, it was atrocious. Yeah. Um, and then. 
it would the, the and that floater, which seems so cool, is like, oh, this is a fun little nifty thing at the beginning of the season because it was so automatic with the Clippers last year. Then it came back towards the end of the year, not to the automatic level, but you know, it was better. Yeah, and he was terrible around the rim for a lot of the season. That I oh my god, did stick. He was with bad me. everywhere. So, yeah, so it serves to reason that he could actually see an improvement there, which would certainly benefit the Knicks bench 100%. even more, uh, assuming he is still on the team. So the other thing to consider too here is. Uh, Blocks per 75, as well as offensive rebounding, right? We know how big offensive rebounding is and how important blocks are. And in 2022, you've got Mitch and Hartenstein. It's hard to see them with the other players in that cluster, but they're there. They're top right. That's exactly where you want to be here. You got Jericho Sims, who, interestingly enough, offensive rebounding, I mean, we know he can do it. He just ranked lower yeah. that season. Um, yeah. His, he's still a it's high not his strongest percentage. suit, I don't think. It's not, no. Um, and then when you move into the last season, this past season, Jericho certainly did a better job. Mitch is still in the top right, and Hartenstein came down a little bit from the blocks per 75 percentile, uh, possessions percentile, which is fine. Uh, he still gave the Knicks so much of what they needed at the five, especially because Jericho is really uh, a third string center based on analytics and how it shakes out. I think you accidentally boxed, boxed Stephen Adams there. I did not. That's Isaiah Hartenstein behind Stephen. Oh, I know. Okay. These we'll, these graphics are a little tough to see. I didn't just Stephen pick Adams. Someone who's uh, yeah, he, he, he's a large man. So I mean, Isaiah Hartenstein is also a large man. He's not as large as Stephen Adams because I don't think anybody is. So there's no. no shame in being blocked by Steven Adams. No, no. He just picked up Isaiah Hartenstein just like he did Tony Bradley. <laughs> and that was it. He carried him off into the distance. So. so we, we've kind of figured out these archetypes, but let's go through them again, right? So at the point guard position, you need to be a pull-up shooter. You need to drive. It also really helps. I mean, this is really from one through four, but you have to be a spot-up shooter. You just you have to be a spot-up shooter, one through four. Um, and also, if you're a pick-and-roll ball handler uh, at the point guard position, that's incredibly important. Now, this is something we also didn't fully get into. I kind of over uh, went over it, or rather... Didn't say too much about it at the time, but shooting guard and small forward, they, they're kind of interchangeable. But let's, let's say shooting guard for now, right? Great to elite defender, spot up shooter, connector. That would describe Quentin Grimes, right? Um, but then you have the three. And the, we didn't talk about this. It's the drives, spotting up, and pulling up. That's really important to be a three. Right now, RJ occupies that spot at the three. He's an incredible driver. He creates so much when he does that. When you get to the four, now I, I should add also, like again, this is where the interchangeability happens. Like, is Balaka two? Is Balaka three? It, I don't want to get too bogged down well, in those types of things. It's not not important. It's just who are, who are these players more alike? Right? Like RJ isn't like Josh Hart, but at the same time. They don't play the same way. So, but like you don't expect RJ to necessarily be a pull-up shooter, but maybe you do. Whereas you don't I, expect Josh Hart to be a pull-up shooter. I think you nailed it though with the, them wanting their twos to be elite defenders, especially now with Jalen Brunson at the one, because most teams in the NBA have a really, I mean, a, someone at the point guard position that is a, dy a dynamic offensive player. And I think we saw this year Quentin Grimes emerge as more of an apt fit to guard those guys um, on a on a nightly basis, at least you know starting out of the gate. Um, it's a little harder to stay with those smaller, quicker guards like the bigger you are. So that's why I think you know having it is there is a, a, a necessity for some modicum of distinction here. Agreed. And at the four, as we mentioned, high usage facilitator. Um, spot up shooter and ideally a scorer that even if we don't know some of the other things but that that differ between Julius and Obi and what the Knicks prefer from that position especially on the offensive end those are baseline things that they at least try to share They're, they've been trying to turn Obi into a spot up shooter maybe it hasn't been the best um process and maybe it's not exactly how he should be that's debatable but that's kind of where they see that type of mold and then at the five offensive rebounder rim protector Pick and roll man for sure. I mean, it should go without saying, but um, fantastic defender. And the requirements for all these players is you got to be high efficiency. You have to be really good in the half court on offense. Uh, and you need to limit your turnovers. Really, a player like Isaiah Hardenstein was just giving the ball away. 
uh, often. And the Knicks said, we're not going to use you exactly as you've been used before. Then we saw it branch out. We saw some nice cuts with Deuce McBride. Uh, There's a really great two man game that happened there. So Hartenstein can still do it. It's just limiting it in a way that doesn't create opportunities for the other team to then score on you and transition. 